Welcome back. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at an alternate way to degrade tyrosine. Now, in a previous video, we looked at tyrosine catabolism and we saw how we degrade it to energy, right? We degrade it to fumarate and we degrade it to two acetyl CoA molecules, right? But in this one, we're actually going to degrade tyrosine to something else that can be used for a reason other than energy production. And what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at the biosynthesis of three neurotransmitters, respectively, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Okay. And the committed and rate limiting step in this biosynthesis is catalyzed by tyrosine hydroxylase. Now, what I will mention at this point is this biosynthesis um, or you could look at it as a tyrosine catabolism. This pathway or this reaction scheme is for the biosynthesis of something called catecholamines. Okay, And I'll, I'll go ahead and mention this because it's important. When we say a catecholamine, we mean it has an amine and it has this characteristic catechol ring which I'm circling. Okay, This ring right here is a catechol ring. So all of the, the members including L-DOPA and after it are catecholamines because they have this characteristic catechol. Okay? And the main catecholamines that we're always concerned with are dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Okay, and this is the pathway that makes them. Okay, like I said, the committed step and rate limiting step in this catabolism is done by tyrosine hydroxylase. And what this enzyme does is it hydroxylates, uh, it hydroxylates tyrosine's phenol ring at a position, at a position ortho to the hydroxyl group and meta to the beta carbon. So if this was your beta carbon right here, right, that's your beta carbon, and this is your hydroxyl group, right, it hydroxylates at a position meta to the beta carbon and ortho to the hydroxyl group, right? And by the way, this is an iron 2 plus dependent enzyme. It's a non-heme iron. Okay, so somewhere in near the active site, there's an, an iron 2 plus cation that exists, and it's bound in there by negatively charged residues in the active site. And one of the things that the iron does is it associates with a coenzyme called tetrahydrobiopterin. And tetrahydrobiopterin is shown right here. Okay, um, Tetrahydrobiopterin is used to hydroxylate um, amino acids. Okay, We've already seen this coenzyme used before. We saw it in phenylalanine hydroxylase. So oftentimes when you are hydroxylating amino acids, um, this is a coenzyme that we use. We'll also see this in tryptophan hydroxylase. It uses the same mechanism. Okay, So one of the atoms of molecular oxygen gets put on that position that's meta to the beta carbon. right? But the other atom of molecular oxygen gets incorporated into tetrahydrobiopterin in the 4-alpha position. And you can see that right here. Here's the 4-alpha hydroxy group on hydroxy tetrahydrobiopterin, right? But remember that hydroxy tetrahydrobiopterin is of no use to us, right? We're going to have to somehow regenerate its resting state, tetrahydrobiopterin. And this is accomplished in two steps. Number one, we're going to use 4-alpha-hydroxy tetrahydrobiopterin dehydratase. And that's what step B is right here. This step right here is 4-alpha-hydroxy tetrahydrobiopterin dehydratase. That's going to give us this molecule right here, and this is called dihydrobiopterin. Sometimes you'll hear tetrahydrobiopterin is THBP. This is dihydrobiopterin, and it's going to get reduced by enzyme C, and that's dihydrobiopterin reductase. And it's going to waste either an NADPH or an NADH to ch and use the electron reducing equivalents of the hydride to ultimately um, reduce dihydrobiopterin to tetrahydrobiopterin. And that regenerates the cycle. Now, what's important about uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, besides the fact that it synthesizes L-DOPA, is the fact that it's regulated on several levels. Um, there are um, enzymes that can phosphorylate tyrosine hydroxylates at specific serine residues. And the enzymes that do this are protein kinase A and calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase. Okay? Whenever these two enzymes phosphorylate tyrosine hydroxylase, it activates it. Okay? And therefore, um, that serves to promote this biosynthesis. Or on some level, you could consider it a catabolic pathway for tyrosine. It's just that we're not degrading it to energy. Okay? And one other thing that's also important is that um, the tetrahydrobiopterin is not in the active site indefinitely. As soon as you hydroxylate tetrahydrobiopterin to make hydroxy tetrahydrobiopterin, it dissociates and requires a new tetrahydrobiopterin. Okay, but while um, 
while the tetrahydrobiopterin is out of the active site, there's some feedback type inhibition that can occur. And if you look later in this pathway, and I'll go ahead and scroll over there now, you see that we synthesize dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. And these three catecholamines can actually come back into the active site of tyrosine hydroxylase and they can sort of block tetrahydrobiopterin from getting into the active site. So what that serves to do is take away one of the substrates for, um, for tyrosine hydroxylase. If it can't get tetrahydrobiopterin into the active site and bind it to that non-heme iron, it can't do the reaction. So having said that, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine can come back and sort of do that pseudo type of feedback inhibition by preventing tetrahydrobiopterin from getting into the active site and acting as a substrate. But anyways, um, this creates L-DOPA. And by the way, these enzymes that we're, we're talking about, both tyrosine hydroxylase and this one, which is aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, these two enzymes are expressed pretty much in every one of the, um, in, well, in all tissues or cells that um, produce these neurotransmitters. Okay, Anything that produces dopamine, norepinephrine, or epinephrine, they all express these two enzymes, both tyrosine hydroxylase and aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. Okay, That's what AAAD is. Okay, So for instance, if you're looking at a, a cell that synthesizes dopamine, like the substantia nigra or the nucleus accumbens, they express these two enzymes. If you're looking at the locus ceruleus, which makes norepinephrine, they have it has to have these enzymes, right? If you're looking at the adrenal medulla, it has to have these enzymes. So any cell that makes catecholamines has to have these two enzymes. What we're going to find is that the later enzymes after this can differ depending on the type of cell. But suffice it to say, what aromatic amino acid decarboxylase does is it's going to decarboxylate the alpha position of L-DOPA. So this... this uh, carboxyl group right here is going to get lost as carbon dioxide and that's the carbon dioxide you see right here and this is a pyridoxal phosphate dependent reaction so if you need to see the mechanism of pyridoxal phosphate dependent decarboxylation certainly go do that but this is going to have exactly the same mechanism as all the other ones okay so if you look at glutamate decarboxylase um, you know things like that they all have the exact same mechanism okay as long as it's pyridoxal phosphate dependent and what this gives you is dopamine now, I'll go ahead and mention this now. We're not going to go into the physiology of the neurotransmitters. We're just looking at their synthesis. Okay, But I will say this. Dopamine is released at large quantities by the nucleus accumbens and the substantia nigra. So that means that those cells have to express tyrosine hydroxylase and aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. Right? But if they're releasing dopamine you could make the argument that they're probably not expressing dopamine beta hydroxylase and they're not. Okay, So in other words, a cell that is actively synthesizing dopamine and releasing it would not be making a whole lot of dopamine beta hydroxylase. It's simply not going to express that enzyme. Okay, But for instance, if you had a norepinephrine synthesizing cell, that one's going to be synthesizing a lot of dopamine beta hydroxylase because it has to have it to make norepinephrine. And that's what we're going to look at right now. So dopamine is going to get consumed um, by dopamine beta hydroxylase. And this is a very strange hydroxylase. This is not a, uh, it's not a tetrahydrobiopterin dependent hydroxylase. It's actually an ascorbate dependent hydroxylase. So this molecule that you see right here, this one right here, this is called ascorbate, or sometimes it's here referred to as ascorbic acid or even vitamin C. So this molecule, this is vitamin C or we can just call it ascorbate. And ascorbate is going to be um, oxidized, it's going to be oxidized into dehydroascorbate. So this molecule right here, this is dehydro, dehydroascorbate. This is all part of the mechanism of the enzyme. And in the process, you're going to lose water. And you're going to hydroxylate the one of the positions on dopamine. Specifically, it's this position right here. In other words, it's the beta carbon. Right? That's why this enzyme is called dopamine beta hydroxylase. Remember that the carbon that the amines on, that was the alpha carbon. Right? If we, if we still had the carboxyl group, that would have been the alpha carbon. And this one, that this carbon that is para to this hydroxyl group and would be meta to this one, right? that's the beta position. 
right? So this is dopamine beta hydroxylase. That's why it's called that. And it's just that ascorbate is used in the mechanism in order to hydroxylate. You end up losing water and dehydroascorbate. In other words, dehydroascorbate is the oxidized version of ascorbate. And this gives you norepinephrine. And sometimes you may hear this referred to as noradrenaline. It's the same thing. But let's actually um, discuss why it's called norepinephrine. Okay, and to understand that, we need to also be looking at epinephrine. Okay, um, when you look at the name epinephrine, what that means is that it's synthesized by a structure above the nephron, thus the name nephrine, epinephrine, right? So epinephrine synthesized by a structure above the nephron or above the kidney. And what is that structure? Well, it's the adrenal medulla. Right, the adrenal medulla, or we could say the adrenal gland as a whole, sits on top of the kidney. And the, the central part of the adrenal gland is the adrenal medulla. And that's the part that synthesizes epinephrine. So that's why it's called epinephrine. Epi means above, so above the nephron. That's where the name epinephrine comes from. And it ends in ene, this in, because it's an amine. Right? If you look, here's your amine. Right? But if we're looking at norepinephrine, oftentimes when you see nor in front of a word in biochemistry that means that it's the it's the molecule that comes right before the other one in the pathway so for instance norepinephrine comes right before epinephrine that's where the nor comes from um, another example um, to illustrate the point there's a in morphine biosynthesis there's the first substrate in the whole pathway is called norcochlorine so the next molecule is cochlorine norcochlorine to cochlorine norepinephrine to epinephrine so i hope that makes sense nor just means that it comes before whatever the suffix is in the pathway so norepinephrine comes before epinephrine likewise you might also see it written as noradrenaline comes before adrenaline so sometimes you'll see epinephrine written as adrenaline now back to norepinephrine the enzyme that makes this is called dopamine beta hydroxylase now let's think about what tissues or cells might express this well, the ones that aren't going to be expressing it are the ones that are going to be making and releasing dopamine, right? Because that would sort of, if they expressed this enzyme, that would sort of defeat the purpose, right? They're trying to make dopamine and they're trying to release it. So if they're actively consuming it to make another product, that would really defeat the purpose of dopamine biosynthesis. So if you're a cell like the substantia nigra or the nucleus accumbens that makes a lot of dopamine, you really want to express this enzyme very much. Okay, But if you're a cell that is making norepinephrine and epinephrine, then you are going to be expressing this enzyme because you have to. For example, a cell that would express this enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase would be something like the locus ceruleus, which is a, a nuclei in the brain that makes a lot of norepinephrine. Okay, that's its main function. Another example, um, sympathetic nerves that make norepinephrine, they would also have to express this enzyme because they're making norepinephrine. Likewise, the adrenal medulla, which makes epinephrine, would also have to express this enzyme because they're making the product that comes right before epinephrine, right? So they have to have this enzyme, okay? And that gives you norepinephrine. And notice the difference. Norepinephrine has this hydroxyl group on the beta position, whereas dopamine does not. Okay. Now let's look at the terminal enzyme in this synthesis. This is called phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase. Okay. Now if you need to see um, where methyl groups come from, because this is a methyltransferase, certainly go back and watch the s methionine video. And that's what this atomet is. Atomet is often abbreviated SAM, and what this means is S-adenosylmethionine. All S-adenosylmethionine is is it's the universal methyl donor. Okay, so for instance, if you look at epinephrine or excuse me, norepinephrine, right? Notice how the only groups that are attached to the nitrogen are just hydrogens, right? And, and, we're, and, and the whole rest of this molecule over here, right? That's it. But notice how in epinephrine, there's a methyl group that's been attached to that nitrogen, right? That methyl group, this one right here, came from s methionine. And whenever you transfer a methyl group from s methionine, your product is always s homocysteine, okay? And that's going to go back into the SAM cycle, and you're going to regenerate SAM, okay? So... SAM, s methionine, atomet, whatever you want to call it, very important for biosynthesis. Certainly go back and watch the video on that. But phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase is what's going to give us epinephrine. Now, again, let's go back to thinking about what type of cells might express this. Would a cell that is wanting to synthesize norepinephrine uh, express this enzyme? And the answer is no. Okay. 
So what we're starting to see is as you go further in this pathway, the amount of cells that are actually expressing these enzymes gets thinner and thinner, right? So as a cell like the locus ceruleus that would would be synthesizing and releasing norepinephrine would not make phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase. But for instance, the adrenal medulla that makes epinephrine, like for instance, the chromaffin cells, the chromaffin cells which release epinephrine would have to be making a large amount of this enzyme so they can make epinephrine. And there are a few nuclei in the brain stem that also make epinephrine. Okay, But the main producer of epinephrine is going to be the chromaffin cells of the adrenal medulla. And they're going to be ones that dump epinephrine into the blood when they get the appropriate stimulus from the nervous system. Okay, So let's do a quick recap of this biosynthesis. And it's on some level, you could consider it a tyrosine catabolic pathway. So tyrosine is going to react with tyrosine hydroxylase and it's going to react in a tetrahydrobiopter independent hydroxylation mechanism in which you hydroxylate tyrosine at the position ortho to the hydroxyl group making L-dopa and you also generate 4-alpha hydroxy tetrahydrobiopterin which gets dehydrated by 4-alpha hydroxy tetrahydrobiopterin dehydratase giving you dihydrobiopterin which gets reduced using reducing equivalents from the hydride of NADPH or NADH using dihydrobiopterin reductase. Now at this point we have L-DOPA which will now react in a pyridoxal phosphate dependent decarboxylation. It's the same mechanism as you would find in something like glutamate decarboxylase or aspartate decarboxylase and so forth. So aromatic amino acid decarboxylase removes the alpha carboxyl group as CO2 and you end up generating dopamine. And remember that dopamine would be synthesized in large amounts by cells of the nucleus accumbens and substantia nigra. Okay. Now, dopamine is going to get consumed in some cells that produce norepinephrine and epinephrine by dopamine beta hydroxylase. This is going to be facilitated by um, oxidizing ascorbate into dehydroascorbate with the subsequent loss of water. This is going to hydroxylate the beta position, which is shown right here, on dopamine to make norepinephrine. And also, what's worth noting is you also generate a chiral center when you hydroxylate. So now we have norepinephrine, and norepinephrine is going to be consumed by phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase. This is going to be an, an s methionine dependent methyltransfer from, to the amine of norepinephrine to make epinephrine. Or you could say we're taking noradrenaline and making adrenaline. Okay? And like we said, um, dopamine beta hydroxylase would be expressed um, in, in cells that make epinephrine and norepinephrine, but phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase would only be expressed in cells making epinephrine like the chromaffin cells or certain uh, cells in the brainstem. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on catecholamine biosynthesis. And one of the things that's really important, in, at least from, a, uh, from a, a student's perspective, is to really think about what cells might be making some of these enzymes and which might not, and just use, use logic. See you in the next video.